Let's get going tonight. I'm excited about this word. We're going we're gonna to share for you our sixth lesson in our studies in Ephesians as we really try to wind down this evening the, the idea of the heavenly bank account while still being very early in this book. We, we are in the first chapter. Tonight we'll be around the 13th, 14th verses, and that's going to be where we really settle in this evening and, and do our, the most part of our work. But we're going to use a little bit of the peripheral, a little bit of the... the uh, Pauline scriptures from elsewhere. I want to, I just want to give you this thought. Uh, this is kind of coming fresh off the heels of us talking about the church and studying the church. One of the reasons that we landed in Ephesians, there's two real reasons. One, we had not walked through a Pauline letter in this group. I wanted to. I love Paul's writings. We've used Paul's writings. We use them all the time. We use them every, every lesson we've done, I guess, probably has a Paul verse in it. I, I don't, I can't imagine we ever made it without it. And that's because Paul's the underpinnings for so much of our New Covenant theology. So part of the reason we're in this book is I want to do a Paul book. Um, the other part is because whenever we went into our series on the church, one of the reasons that we went into that series is because in Paul's third chapter, he talks about the mystery being revealed and that one of those mysteries, because there's multiple mysteries, there's a lot of stuff we don't understand. That's okay. Um, you're not in a necessarily safe space in Christianity if you're in a place where they feel like they have everything figured out. Okay, so one of your first warnings that you might need to switch congregations is when no one asks good questions. And another sign is when leadership never changes their mind. Um, mysteries cause you to change your mind. Mysteries need to be unpacked. They need to be experienced. They need to be questioned. Paul's writings are full of mystery, the mystery of God. If you got to figure it out, it's not a mystery. So why, how can we call God a mystery if we got him all figured out? I don't have him all figured out. I don't want to have him all figured out. I love this journey. I love the excitement of thinking that I could learn something new tomorrow about the Lord that I don't know today. It's one of the reasons I open my Bible. I don't open it out of obligation. Got to read today. If I don't read, I'm not going to be blessed. Uh, God's not going to like me. Um, I'm not going to be anointed Sunday. No, but I want to see him in there. So Part of the reason we're in Ephesians is the, because Paul talks about the mystery of the, the church being a part of God's great mystery that reveals the wisdom of God to the world. God chose to do it that way. He could have chose to do it however he wanted, but he chose to have the church as the arm of revelation for the powers and principalities of this world. There's no force of darkness or power that the world has, either behind its systems in its, in its pseudo-religion, um, in its materialism, uh, in its idolatry. All of those things have power structures behind them in the realm of the Spirit. And none of those power structures can stand against what Christ reveals through His church. I'm in awe of that. While at the same time, not necessarily being in awe of every local church. I mean, who is, I, I think we all could find problems in every single church. We could also find good things in every single church. But the church is what drove me into this book to say, okay, then out of this treasure trove of the church is that which reveals the wisdom of God to the principalities and powers of the world. What would we need to know as a church? And you might think, well, you're sitting in a, in a little theater having a Bible study, which we've been doing for years here. Does that qualify as a church, uh, I like what the Eastern Christians say in the Eastern Orthodox Church. We can never say where the church is not. We can only say where the church is. What's that mean? It means if you are here, two or three of us gathered in His name, we can say where the church is. I can't tell you where the church is not. I'm not smart enough to identify what's not the church. I don't qualify. Believers get together. They commune in Christ's name. Sounds like it might be the church. I can't tell you it's not the church. I can tell you what is the church. Two or three gather together in my name. I'll be in the midst of them. That's the church. That's what this is. It doesn't have a steeple. It doesn't have a sign out in the yard. It doesn't have this formality of... So-and-so is running this, and so-and-so is doing this. We're going to have this program, try to build this. And all that's fine. Great. Wonderful. If that floats your boat, go for it. Build something. Don't build something. But inside this unit, something is happening that is a revelation of the mystery of God. And 
I want to keep unpacking that whether we call it church or not because I can't tell you wh where the church is not, but I am not going to miss the chance to tell you where the church is. And for me, every week it's coming in right here. And that, that's worth something. And if it's worth something, it's worth talking about the thing that I think really makes us a church. And what makes you a church is not a building, a charter, uh, statements of faith, bus, youth pastor, uh, music team. It's, it's the presence of the Holy Spirit in community. To me, that's why you can name where the church is. Because I've been to some places that didn't look like a church, but you could feel the presence of the Holy Spirit in community. You go, the church was meeting right there. You ever had that? Been around a, a restaurant table? Spirit of the Lord is speaking among people. The church was eating here tonight. You go, we, we always say we were eating with church people like people from our church. We should probably change that. The church was meeting at that table tonight. The presence of the Spirit communed over through the saints of God. So let's talk Holy Spirit tonight. That's in effect where Paul lands his spiritual bank account text. And by, what, by bank account, I mean these are the things that you get to reach into that belong to you in Christ, in Him. And, and Paul says it over and over again. So you need to reach into those things and find out what belongs to you. Here's our two verses tonight from Ephesians chapter 1 in a lesson we'll call Sealed with the Spirit. And you're going to know why real quickly because it's right here in the very first verse we read, verse 13. In Him, this is part of the in Christ passages that are repetitious over and over, particularly in the first 14 verses of Ephesians. In Him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. And I derive tonight's title, Sealed with the Spirit, because Paul lays out a concept that I think I've just ran, I ran over it for years. What are believers? They're sealed with the Spirit. But didn't put a lot of thought into what that actually means, because I didn't put a lot of thought into what it would have meant to the audience in Ephesians. That's important. And then what it means to me spiritually. And I'm not going to try and establish some theological bedrock statement on this, but I am going to say something that I, I feel I've put a lot of wrestling in in my own experience, and that's this. I truly believe that this lesson tonight, Sealed with the Spirit, could be one of those foundational sort of shifting messages in the way people view their personal salvation. And I talk to you a lot about how I think the, the phrase personal salvation has actually hurt us. Because I think we're, we, we, because we think we have a personal salvation, that means I don't need anybody else. And that's led to a lot of deconstruction in ways that you can't rebuild easily. Because you, you isolate yourself, become an island, and you find out you kind of needed some stuff you burned on the way out. There's a few bridges you'd like to go back across, but they're gone. And yeah, you got to rebuild them from nothing. So I, I'm real careful about the deconstruction idea from a personal salvation standpoint. But I do want to talk about your personal understanding tonight. because I, And the reason I think this could be shifting is because if you've ever struggled with how saved am I and how long is my salvation valid for? Is it valid until my next sin? Is it valid until my next mind shift? What do I have to do to maintain it, to grow in it? then this could be one of those messages that kind of helps you to settle on that. So we stay with that thought. Verse 14, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. I don't want to work too hard on 14 yet because 14 really is just, that's what you get. But I need to try to prove to you because I think that's Paul's goal is to try to prove to you that what you get is worth having and that what you get isn't as easy to lose as some of us were taught that it is. And that's why, I mean, this could be theologically shifting because you've kind of had, you may have had this idea and maybe those watching and listening have had this idea about your Christian journey and maybe how easy it is to lose it or how tough it is to maintain it or to hold on to it. And I don't think Paul agrees with that. And I think his phrase about being sealed is part of it. I want to show you, first of all, that this is not a standalone thought for Paul. Okay, here's 2 Corinthians chapter 1, 21, 22. So this is the same guy, different church different audience, not Ephesus, but Corinth. He who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us is God, who also has sealed us and given us the Spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. And there's his sealing again. 
But Paul does something here that is not obvious in the English that I think would have been a little more obvious to a Jew who understood Torah. Paul uses the phrase anointed. He has anointed us and sealed us. The word anointed in the Hebrew is to literally smear. So I always try to imagine, because this was my first experience with anointing. Um, we, we would have prayer lines and we would anoint people with oil. I look at my dad on this because I, that, I can stretch all the way back to the first time I ever remember hearing the phrase anointed used. And we would anoint with oil. Okay. We did not assume, and by the way, anointing with oil was something we would do in service in which we were bringing people forward for prayer for whatever reason, a healing, a uh, miracle, uh, whatever. And we would, they'd, most of the time you'd line up or you'd come forward and you'd have a little vial of olive oil and you'd take a little bit of oil and put it on your finger and, you'd, and you would smear it across the forehead and then we would pray for them. And so from a very early age, I, I heard anoint and smear very closely connected. Of all the things I've kind of knocked down over the years and tried to rearrange in my own theology, it's, in, it's kind of impressive to me that inadvertently I sort of stumbled into what the Hebrews would have thought when they said the word anointing. Because we think of the anointing as this almost supernatural feeling that comes over people when they sing or when they play or when they preach. And that it can be geared up, cranked up, you know, in some circles. You can be more anointed. The anointing can be really powerful tonight. Uh, he has a light anointing. I always thought that was funny. <laughs> yeah. He's a light anointing. <laughs> I guess, you know, he's, he's smeared light. <laughs> it's not, not heavy smears. You know, you got to be in the right circumstances for his anointing to show up. But the, that doesn't have anything to do with emotion. And to a Hebrew mind, it wouldn't have anything to do with emotion. It didn't have to do with, ooh, you feel those goosebumps? That's the anointing. It was the smearing. And it first appears in the Torah, way back in Genesis, when Noah builds the ark. And the Bible tells us that he was told to uh, anoint it with pitch, smear it over with pitch. And that was basically a coating on the inside and outside of the wood and the ark so that the, it became waterproof, so that it didn't leak. So the anointing is not, the, the anointing in Hebrew terms was not for you to go do great things. The anointing was to seal you off so that what was on the outside of the boat could not get into the ark. Okay, smeared. Paul puts them back to back in that he says, he who establishes you in Christ smeared you and sealed you. We lose that in the English. So Paul's basically saying the whole, God has smeared you over and look at his smearing as a sealing, S-E-A-L, sealing you so that you are compact. Whatever's on the inside of you doesn't get to the outside. Whatever's on the outside doesn't get to the inside. And this isn't something you get after a super amount of time spent alone with God. Some of our Pentecostal heritage has taught us that the anointing was the thing you got after you paid some sort of spiritual price, which was never actually a real price. No one ever told you how much it was. If you saw someone you thought was greatly anointed, you were convinced they had paid a greater price. And what that price was, was always works. Always works. And a lot of asceticisms and a lot of self uh, mutilation, maybe not physically, but spiritually or mentally or whatever, to try and pay that price. And Paul gives a different example of it. So I want to use the, the, that thought, and we'll, we'll use the one that Paul uses in Ephesians. To be sealed with the spirit of promise, and I'm going to take the word sealed, which is the Greek word sphragizo. I know you don't need those. We don't speak Greek, but I might... I want it for those who want to learn, run them, all right? If you want to run reference or you want to look it up or you want to be able to see if you can find it in your lexicon or whatever. And the word, by definition, is to indicate permanency. I love that phrase. Permanency, not temporary. Ter permanency and, and security. If something's permanent, how long does it last? Well, by its very definition, it's not going anywhere. 
So when Paul tells us we're sealed over, he uses a phrase that is not temporary, but permanent. If you're sealed over of the Spirit, then how long would the seal be good for? Okay, that's where you need to, that's why this could be theologically shifting. So if you're afraid that you're leaking, <laughs> you need to understand the, the reason maybe you're afraid you're leaking is because perhaps you have an idea that it's your job to hold off the things of the world. But I want to challenge that idea. And I want to tell you that it's the Holy Spirit's job to hold off the things of the world. Thus, you're smeared and sealed. And the sealing is permanent and secure. Here's an interesting thing. The Papyri of Fayum. Fayum is a city in northern Egypt. And when, they, when archaeologists are bringing goods out from tombs or they're bringing them out from houses that, that are uncovered, we learn a lot. We learn a lot about the culture and the, uh, the, of the world in which those things are found. And so the, the papyri of Fayum, here, here's an interesting thing that we found. And when we find anything that is written in the language of the Bible, it piques the biblical archaeology mind. Because you go, ooh, they use that word in a different context. And we have found the word that Paul uses was used in the papyri of Fayum as the sealing of sacks. A sealing was whatever is in the bag was guaranteed to have the full complement of its contents. Whatever the label said was in the bag, if it were sealed by the seller, the seller was guaranteeing that whatever's inside of that is exactly what was supposed to be inside of that. That's how the world around Ephesus was using that word. Paul grabs that word, drops it in, and goes, let me tell you something about sealing. You've been sealed over with the Holy Spirit of promise. You are full of whatever the Holy Spirit says you're full of because he sealed you. He guaranteed what's inside of you. It's not your guarantee. It's his guarantee. It's not the buyer's guarantee. It's the seller's guarantee. It's the seller saying to the buyer, this is what I say it is. If I say it has this many pounds of sugar in this bag. It's on me for there, as the seller for there to be this many pounds of sugar in the bag. Otherwise, I can't put my seal on it because if I put my seal on it, I've guaranteed that's what you're getting. I think that's an interesting word for Paul to use in regards to you having the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit then has looked inside of you and went, yep, that's what I say it is. Close you up, seal you over. It's what I say it is. Okay, that's Ephesus. But let's use it in the biblical context. So I want you to see it through the eyes of the world first. Okay, because sometimes seeing it through the eyes of the world gives you an idea of how to use it in the world. Because I hope you realize that the biblical writers are they're led of the Spirit, but they are real world people. <laughs> they're real world people in that they actually lived in the world. They had jobs and families and houses and dreams and hopes and they had to bring all that to the table and this is why our biblical writers if we're honest they sound different across time because they're bringing their own self and it's the same way with preaching we're all we all have the same holy spirit and we're all reading the same bible but we don't all sound the same so we bring something we are to the presentation and you can love that or hate that and we do because sometimes you hear preaching, it's a good word, and you go, oh, I hate that delivery. I don't like that. You know, I don't like the way the guy says that. I don't like the way she does that. Fine. And then others, the content might not even be great, but man, what a voice. Or really funny, or, you know, or in my case, really good looking. You know, just whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Bob, you told me on your way in that you've listened long enough that you know what I'm going to say before I say it. You didn't, you didn't see that one coming, did you? That's what I'm going for. All right, let me, show you, let me show you sealed through the eyes of the secular world. Let's use Daniel 6. Now, you might be thinking Daniel 6 is not secular, but the story is. It's a secular king. Daniel 6, 15. These men approached the king. This is Daniel in the lion's den, by the way. These men approached the king and said to the king, No, O king, it's in the law of the Medes and the Persians that no decree or statute which the king establishes may be changed. They've caught Daniel praying. He's not supposed to pray. They made a law that you can't pray. So they've set him up. But the king likes Daniel. So the king gave the command, and they brought Daniel, and they cast him into the den of lions. But the king spoke, saying to Daniel, 
your God whom you serve continually, he will deliver you. This is one of the great statements of faith by a heathen in the Bible. Think about this. Your God whom you serve continually is going to deliver you. There's, we, that'd be hard to say as a believer in Christ, just to say to somebody, I know you're supposed to die in this, but you're not going to die in this. So what a statement of faith. So then a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the signets of his lords that the purpose concerning Daniel might not be changed. I want you to see what happened. The king says, hey, Daniel, this isn't fair. I know, they set you up. But we got a law and I got to honor it or I'm not a good king and I'll lose a lot of face if I don't honor it but I think your God's going to deliver you. And I'm going to make sure that this is the end of this because when we put the stone over the door of the lion's den, I'm going to seal it. This is the phrase that was just used. I'm going to seal it with my own ring. And whatever is sealed by the king is the done deal. Okay? If the king seals it, then whatever comes out the other side is the end result. So it sounds more like this in that next phrase. Remember, you've ever heard this phrase? That sealed his fate. When he said that, that sealed his fate. Where did we get that phrase? The seal was to seal the fate. Whatever happened in that lion's den was the final verdict. Daniel survived and thus Daniel could not be executed. Because the seal meant whatever happens behind this door, that's, that's it. And that's why the king said to him, your God's going to deliver you. I'm going to put my seal on it so that when your God delivers you, you can't walk out and they kill you anyway, because that's what they're going to try to do. If you survive this lion's den, they want you dead so badly, they're just going to kill you tomorrow, but not if I put my seal on it, because the seal is a verdict from above that says this is a final, this is a final verdict sealed your fate. What if you could take that thought from a secular standpoint and then Flip it into a positive gospel sermon because you don't even have to work that hard with the Daniel text to do that because I, I can see it in your faces when you see it because you, you kind of like, yeah, he survived the lion's den. He can't be killed. That means whatever God says about me is exactly what has to happen to me. And you got that out of a, of a secular king sealing the, 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 the lion's den it had nothing to do with God. What if you could put that into the gospel account? Let's do that. Matthew 27. We go to post-Calvary. On the next day, following the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered together to Pilate and said, Sir, we remember while he was still alive how that deceiver said, After three days I will rise. You know they're talking about Jesus. Okay. Jesus has just died. Therefore... Command that the tomb be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away and say to the people he has risen from the dead, that last deception would be worse than the first. If, if they lie to everybody and act like he's alive, this thing's going to get out of hand. Pilate said to them, you have a guard, go your way, make it as secure as you know how. They went and made the tomb secure, sealing the stone and setting the guard. And in all of our Easter sermons, we just have them roll the stone to the door. We don't ever talk about why Matthew felt it was necessary to throw the phrase sealing the stone. Because they understood what the seal meant. This isn't them putting caulk around the edges of the rock, you know, so that no air can get in on the body. The sealing, Pilate just gave him permission. Pilate goes, do whatever you have to do to make it as secure as possible. And they went, okay. Pilate gave us permission. Pilate's seal determines that this is it. We don't get to go in here and do anything else. So when Jesus comes out of the grave, the seal has been placed that whatever comes out this other side is the end. If Daniel comes out of this lion's den, you don't get to kill him again. No one, no one could have imagined. If Jesus comes out of this tomb, you don't get to kill him again. I think that's awesome. Yeah. That's pretty cool. And so Matthew sort of sneaks that in. That's a Daniel idea. He sort of sneaks that into the gospel of Matthew, that sealing of the, 
the, the sealing of the tomb. Let's put that one along with some others. And I don't want to run all night long into the, into the others. We'll talk about them for a little bit. Jesus came out of the tomb. Final verdict, death loses. If Jesus comes out of the tomb, you can't kill him again. Tomb didn't work, so Jesus wins. There's more, and this is where I don't want to get in the weeds too much, but the 144,000 in Revelation chapter 7 are sealed, and Satan is sealed to his doom in Revelation chapter 20, and we could do other sealings, but I, want to, I just want to hit these real quick. However you feel about the book of Revelation, and I think most of you know that I don't feel the book of Revelation is a book of your prophetic future in regards to world events on a chronological timeline. So you don't need to read the book of Revelation and freak out because you saw some news story that you think looks like something you saw in Revelation. Uh, until you see a literal dragon come out of the ocean with seven heads, you don't have to worry about whether or not the book of Revelation is trying to tell you literal events. You're dealing with a book of signs and symbols. And signs and symbols would mean that the numerology of Revelation would have deeper meaning than just numbers. Twelve tribes with 12,000 per tribe is 144,000. Twelve is a number of um, fullness and government. Jesus has 12 disciples. You, 12 pops up over and over again. And Revelation seems to be telling you that there's a fullness to the people of God that was a number beyond 12. And so it's the derivative, 12 12s. And 144,000 then is a number that we don't have to sit around and we got whole denomination, we whole, whole religious sects that are built around 144,000 getting in. And I always thought, how do you know you're one of the 144,000? Shouldn't you like stop evangelizing when you get to that number? Like, have a, like I have a national counter that says this is as big as our church is. And then if you get to 144,001, somebody's got to go because somebody's not getting in. That seems pretty counterintuitive to evangelism. Am I alone in that? Okay. Um, that has always confused me. Like if there's only 144,000, then cap it off, man. <laughs> Like, come in under the wire. There's like 143,000 of us. We're just being safe. Don't anybody, if you have kids, they got to change religions because I'm not getting out for your kid. You think I'm missing this because you couldn't control yourself? No. Point being, <laughs> I, no, I was in the weeds there a little bit, I admit. Point being, we don't look at that book to find exacts. We look at that book to find signs and symbols. And so we're not look, we don't expect that God literally puts a tattoo on the forehead of 144,000. Nor is it just 144,000. But God's game at preserving His people from what's going on in the world in Revelation 7 was to seal them. Which isn't that big of a change from Ephesians chapter 1 that tells you, you are sealed by the Holy Spirit to the day of redemption. So what Revelation is doing is just putting into illustrative language what Paul already told you was going to happen. So you are sealed over by the Spirit. This was also in contrast to those marked by the beast. You are not marked by the beast. You are sealed by the Spirit. All right. And so then in the end, Satan's doom is prophesied as he is sealed over when he's put into chains because God has done it permanently. I hope you can catch my permanence. Daniel, you, get, you don't get to be killed. Jesus, they don't get to kill you again. 144,000, you're sealed over. The beast can't have you. Satan, sealed into your doom. Too bad. You, sealed by the spirit of promise until the day of redemption. What does our seal indicate? Go back to the text. Ephesians 1, 13, 14. In Christ, I placed my trust. I just want to slow down right here and do this before we really lock it in with the 14th verse. When did you trust? You trusted after you heard the word of truth, which was the good news of your salvation. We've got to bring the gospel back to being good news. I mean, it's supposed to be called good news. And then a bunch of stuff that we're talking about isn't good news. It's just scary and full of fear and pain and anger and hatred. And who wants to sit through that? And I don't blame people for running from a lot of stuff that's called the church because it's not good news. And if you're going to talk to people about the king is coming, that's good news. If you live in a kingdom and the king's on his way there, that's a really good idea. It's great news. The, king, the king's won. He beat, he's won the victory. He beat the other forces. He's conquered all. The king has arrived. The king is, the king is here. And in the king, that's good news. And so present the king. That's the gospel of your salvation. 
some of the stuff we're arguing about and we're fighting about is ancillary to good news. And we're getting so wrapped up in fighting about the stuff on the side that we're missing out on the fact that good news is ours. So if the gospel of, the tr of truth has been presented to you and, and we believe, and having believed, we realize that we are sealed over with His Holy Spirit. Sealed over with His Holy Spirit is sealed not by man, it is sealed by God. Stay there real quick because I want 14 to add to this. We're going to run to one more passage. St Go back. It's all right. Who is, not what is. Right here. Who is, not what is. The Holy Spirit is not what seals me over, but who seals me over. The person of the Holy Spirit seals me over. This is relational talk, not object talk. Okay. Relational talk is... I'm in a relationship with, this is why I told you this is going to be personal salvation type sermon. I'm in a relationship with him in which he does the work. He sealed me. I don't seal me. And it's not what seals me, like my knowledge seals me or my effort seals me. That would be what is the guarantee. It's who is the guarantee. If who is the guarantee, then he guarantees it. Why do you have a co-signer at the bank? I mean, for what purpose is the other person existing? Because the other person is the who that guarantees what you're signing. So that the bank knows they don't just have one who. <laughs> it's not just you. If you're a loser and you don't do what you're supposed to do, we're going after the other guy. He put his name on this and therefore he's on the hook for this. That's why you better know who you're co-signing for because if they up and leave, the bank's got your number too. So, yeah, but that wasn't my money. Too bad. You're the who. And you're on this. He has guaranteed me. And it's not by a work of man. I, I want to throw in one more set of scriptures just to, just to tighten this up from John 1.12 and then we'll land. As many as received him. You've seen these many, many times. We've worked on this over and over. But here's one more night. And maybe with what you just heard, this will look differently. As many as received him, he gave him the right or the authority to become or to be called children of God or to call themselves, a little closer to the Greek, to those who believe in him, he gave them the right to call themselves the children of God. To those who believe in his name, look at this, they were born, but they were not born by blood. They were not born by the will of the flesh. They were not born by the will of man. They were born by God. So if it wasn't blood and it wasn't the will of man and it wasn't the flesh, then it had to be something else. So my birth in Christ doesn't have anything to do with the natural realm. Doesn't have anything to do with my parental, my family, my blood, my heritage, my nation, my nationality, my tongue, my gender, my religion, my effort, my performance. It must be invisible. It can't be visible. It can't be tracked through my own effort. It must be his, which means it's his work. So let's land on the guarantee. Paul said, in Ephesians 1, the guarantee of our inheritance. Guarantee is the Greek word, arabon, which is earnest money deposited by the purchaser and forfeited if the purchase is not completed. It's served in the old world as a pledge. I leave my pledge that I'm going to pay you. The first time we see this in the Bible, it's in a really secular and vile use. Remember when Judah slept with Tamar in the Old Testament and he thought it was a prostitute and it was his daughter-in-law trying to get pregnant to have a son that Levrite marriage promised her was hers and she deceived him and he didn't have any money to pay the prostitute. He had left her with, a, with some livestock but he didn't have enough money and so he left her with a pledge. He left her with his signet ring and his staff, which was kind of like his credit card and his ID, which was his way of saying, I'm coming back for this. It's his pledge. The fact that he left it, not only does it mean I'm coming back for this, it means not only am I coming back for this, I'm good for this. It means if I don't come back, then I'm a thief and a liar. Now you can 
we can say all day long, well, what a big deal. You also visited a prostitute. So, you know, being a thief and a robber might be the least of your problems. But the point of the story was that by leaving the pledge, you were leaving a piece of yourself that you guaranteed you were going to come back to receive by bringing what you promised. Another phrase for guarantee in the New Testament is down payment. Christ gives you the Holy Spirit, seals you over with the Holy Spirit as a down payment on what is yet to come. If Christ doesn't do what he sealed you over with, he's a thief and a liar. Now, if this doesn't shift your theology, if you're struggling with wondering if you're really saved, it is not yours to keep you saved. He sealed you with a down payment. He guaranteed it. If he doesn't do it, He's a liar. It's pretty bold. Yes, it was. Paul did it. That's why he lays that out there. Earnest money deposited. In a natural, modern illustration, you know when you get a jar of canned goods and it's sealed, it's sealed with the little metal lid, and you maybe use paraffin wax or you heat the jar and you remove the air from it and it's sealed. Why do we seal it over? The seal on a jar, once it's broke, is broken. Once you pop that seal and you hear that little pop and the metal pops back up on that seal, the air has went in underneath the lid and whatever's on the outside now contaminates whatever's on the inside. And if you take that jar after you've popped that seal and flip it upside down, whatever's on the inside can start to run out over the edges of that lid, you stand there long enough, it's gonna be in the floor. What happened? We broke the seal. Why do we put the seal on it? To preserve it. To preserve what is on the inside from getting to the outside and to preserve what is on the inside from being infiltrated by what is on the outside. Why would the Holy Spirit seal you over? Because you live in a world that is not your home. And you need to guarantee that what He put inside of you isn't going anywhere because you're not always going to feel saved. You're probably not even always going to act saved. But you're not going to feel saved. Sometimes you're not going to be conv- you're, you're going to wonder if it took. <laughs> I used to have people say that. You know, Pastor, I gave my heart to the Lord, but I just wonder if it took. Because, you know, I got some problems. I go, hey, welcome to the family. Families have problems. People have stuff, but you're sealed. And the sealing is his work, not your work. And so what has he done? He has sealed you so that what he poured in you isn't going anywhere. He poured righteousness into you, poured unforgiveness into you. He poured justification. He poured himself. He didn't go anywhere. But if you get flipped upside down, and the world will flip you upside down, what's in you isn't going anywhere. What's out there can't get in. And it's going to hit you hard, man. It's coming at you. But it can't get in because sealed by the Spirit. Final thought. This is why it's important to see the Spirit as more than this mist, this little entity. It's also such an insult for us to act as if the Holy Spirit is so shady and soft that He can be so excited by songs and good sermons and so turned off by chewing gum and, and uh, shorts. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like the Holy Spirit. We, I don't think we realize what we're doing. We're playing with the most important part of our constitution, our spiritual constitution. We're playing with it like something we throw around. So we come into service and talk about the Holy Spirit being offended and talk about we need to pray the Holy Ghost down and then the Holy Spirit really loves fast songs and, and he gets so offended by certain instruments and just stupidity until we don't even really understand the Holy Spirit anymore because he's an it and he's really cantankerous. He's ticked off all the time and he's great at finding sin and that's about all he's great at. Finding sin, making people shout. And when he really gets going, he'll start knocking them out on the floor. Maybe they'll laugh. And I mean, I, could, I say these things because I've had experience, so much experience in this stuff, calling it the Holy Spirit, that I'm shocked I'm still living for Christ. But it's because I've encountered the real Jesus and I realize I'm sealed. 
and that all the junk couldn't actually get in there. It, it ran up against my mind and it hurt my sensitivities sometimes and it screwed me up for a long time and maybe it still has. But I'm sealed because I've met Jesus. I'm only still in this because I've met Christ and believe that what He put in me can't be taken out. And that what is out there can't get in because He's on guard. He's watching. Up. He's, it's not an it to me. It's not a mist. It's not easily offended entity. It's not a ghost. It's not some emotion, some tickle, some shout, some tongue. That's an insult. He's God. He's the expression of God that gets to live inside of me. That's the Holy Spirit. And He isn't going anywhere. So get over yourself and your ability to sin so well. He isn't going anywhere. You're going to have a hard time running Him off. He sealed you. Whatever goes on behind this rock is the done deal, He said. <laughs> sealed with the Spirit. Let's pray. Thank you, Father. You are good. <laughs> I don't say this enough to you, Lord. And because I don't say it enough to you, I don't say it enough out loud. I don't have any regrets about the stuff I've went through. I hate a lot of it. I'm not proud of all of it, but I don't have any regrets. And it taught me a lot about myself and it taught me a lot about you. I know you didn't put me through any of it, but you never left me in any of it either. Only in hindsight do we see that we were sealed the whole time. Thank you. If we've helped one person in this room, one person around the world who watches or listens to this, to realize that they are sealed by the Spirit and they can relax and now go be sons and daughters, then Father, it's, it was worth the whole journey just to learn something. And I pray that for all of us. We learn what it means to be sealed with the Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Oh.